Good afternoon, everybody, <coughs> and welcome to TGIK number 128. We are going to do a little bit of an audit of different RBAC tools and tooling and documentation and things. We're going to play with some stuff and get creative. We have a lot. There's a, there's a ton of stuff out there for RBAC, so it should be a fun one. Um, I'm looking forward to this one. So let's see who we got with us in the chat today. We got Mr. Rory McCune, McCune saying hello from Scotland, and Chucko saying from, hello from Jakarta. David Michael checking in from Minnesota. And Rodolfo, ready to learn. I'm ready to learn, too. This is the best thing about this show is learning every day, every Friday. <clears throat> so, Maddie, good to see you. This is your idea for an episode, actually. I actually I was looking through the issues list on um, the TGIK repo, and I came across an issue from Lamaddy about like evaluating the different RMAC things. And so I thought that sounds like a great idea. So thank you very much for sharing that one. idea, Mr. Lumetti. <coughs> we got the Zolt, Zolt from Olu, Finland. Good to see you. AJ saying hello and good afternoon. And Martin from the Netherlands. Good to see you, Martin. Very consistent viewer, Mr. Martin is. Juka from Helsinki, Finland. And Jeremy saying hello, checking in. And Halm from Israel and Tim. <clears throat> My good buddy Timmy Carr hanging out and ready to hammer on some R back. And we got Bojanch from Macedonia and Rada saying hello from Arizona. Today in Alameda is a seasonably, I guess, very warm day comparatively. And I think that like the outside temperature is like, I don't know. Actually, let's. I'm curious. Let's find out. Alameda weather. It's 85 degrees outside. Oh my God, it's so hot. I'm kidding. It's California weather, you know. So for for us, for us, for us Californians, this is quite warm in Alameda, and there's like no wind or anything. So kind of surprisingly, surprisingly toasty. But I was reminded of that because Texas and Arizona, you know, like my meager 85 degrees is sort of a, a terrible joke compared to like some of the weather y'all get. Like, <laughs> oh my goodness. 85 is probably closer to a heat wave that uh, Rory McCune experiences in Scotland. That would be like crazy hot there. <coughs> or Ian from Wales. Good to see you. Yeah, no. No, I'm good without the humidity. Thank you, though. Like, Maui Lion. I grew up on an, I grew up on Maui. I have I have experienced humidity in my time. Yeah. Wajanj from Macedonia saying 90 degrees there. Woo! Toasty weather. Well, it's good to see you all. Yeah, Southern California. Where you're, you're like I, Mr. Steve Wong also works with me. Good to see you, Steve. And Sudeep checking in from Toronto. Yeah, moved from Texas to Toronto. I, you know, I've heard people re regard uh, Canada as Texas North because there's a lot of uh, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I do feel like there's a lot of people running around in trucks. There's like huge wide open spaces. It's like the same. It's the same in, as Texas in that way. In that like, there's huge areas where it's just like wide open. There's nothing there. Mr. Brian Lyles checking in. Good to see you, Brian. And Sadeep saying, "No way. It's not that way." All right. Good to see you all. Mona saying, 70 degrees." All right. Let's see what else we got happening today. Let's go over to our notes. Let me make this a little bigger. I think it's actually pretty okay, but oh no. How about that? There we go. Ooh. Too big. Oop. Yeah. <coughs> so these this week's notes, as usual, are up at tgik.io slash notes. Mr. George is hanging out with us today. George Castro, and he's in Michigan. And he says it's very it's basically southern Canada. <laughs> Tom saying hello from the Netherlands. All right. So this week's notes, we got some interesting stuff happening, including some of the work by the SIG cluster or SIG. Or is it a working group? Let's take a look at this article. Introducing hierarchical namespaces, which in itself should kind of break your brain a little bit because it kind of breaks my brain a little bit. But, you know, it is what it is. This is coming from Adrian Ludwin, who works at Google. And this is actually talking about some of the work that is coming out of the working group for multi-tenancy. And what this is highlighting is you know, effectively kind of the same problem that we've seen over the years working with Kubernetes, which is that like, 
you know, one of the big questions that always comes up is what goes into a namespace? Is a namespace something that you use to encapsulate just some portion of an app so that you can make use of the primitives of things like, you know, CPU limits and, and memories or memory limits for a particular area, those sorts of things, right? Or do you consider a namespace to be associated with a person? And do you represent that, do you represent that, um, the, the content of that namespace to a specific group or to a person? And, you know, I think these are the, these are the questions that like, I think in almost literally every Kubernetes discussion I've ever had that goes into any depth at all, like we always come to this very topic. And so I think with the multi-tenancy group, we're actually starting to try and think about some of the other ways to solve this problem. So they have a hierarchical namespace controller that you can play with today and deploy with. And it might be kind of an interesting thing to do an episode on, explore these things. Um, they've started digging into like some of the ideas of how, uh, some of the behaviors of how these things, would, uh, how something like a multi, um, uh, how a hierarchical namespace would be able to handle inheritance, inheritance of things like role bindings or policy top objects um, copied from the parent to the child, things like this, and then delegated creation. So like if you are the, if you are, uh, if you are in an administrative role for a hierarchical namespace, then you should probably also have the ability to create uh, the lower namespaces underneath that level. And I actually also haven't looked into this myself yet, but I wonder how high up the stack it goes. Like, is there only one level of hierarchy or is it, or can you actually create multiple? I don't know. Might be one of those things we dig into when we actually do this episode. Yeah, Tim, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm on Alameda, so it's like the same kind of bombiness. It's, it's a pretty heavy day comparatively. Uh, oh, I need to bump the volume. Let me see if I can do that. How about that? Is that better? Check, check, checkity check, check. Better on the sound, Mr. Lamedi? <coughs> I'm also curious about limit ranges, but I think that they take it into account. So it'd be kind of interesting to see. We've got Noel saying hello from Argentina. All right, great. And yeah, I mean, they talk about like network policy. They talk about different objects. They talk about they have this idea from uh, in, in labels that uh, map that map that map the inherited from and that kind of thing. So, if you're interested, definitely check it out. Might be kind of some a fun weekend project to explore and play with. Mr. Steve Wade, good to see you again. So that's an exciting new that's an exciting new project, and it, it, it seems like they're in a place now where they're ready for some feedback and they're interested in like digging into a bit more. The 119 release team is on break to prep for KubeCon and will resume on the 24th of August. 119 is is pretty close, right? We're almost to the point where we're ready to kick 119 out the door. And in so doing, we've also started to explore um, the 120 release team. Mr. Jeremy Ricard will be the 120. Uh, release manager, which is super exciting. Jeremy is awesome and uh, works with me here at VMware. Does a, a bunch of really great work in the community and and has for some time. So it's great to see Jeremy stepping up and leading the release manager role. That's awesome. The dot releases. There were some dot releases this week, and if you're interested in the changes, um, so basically there's another patch release for each of the supported versions, 16, 17, and 18. If you're interested in the changes, you can click on the link and take a look at the changes. Hmm. Go the wrong way. Got to be something in 118. Since 118, so ah, this is a bump to this is a bump of the Go version. Bump and go to one thirteen fifteen. There's been a lot of revo revolution. I mean, been a lot of cycles on Go lately. It's been releasing pretty hot and heavy lately, so I imagine this is a this has been part of that. So this is basically bumping the Go version. A lot of the bigger changes were in earlier versions, but still good to get updated if you're tracking that. <coughs> Doesn't look like there are any other major issues that are called out in the notes. In the cloud native ecosystem, Monday begins the exciting the excitement of KubeCon Cloud Native Europe Virtual Con Convention. This is the one that we would have had in Amsterdam earlier this year, uh, but with the world being what it is, uh, it became a virtual. At first, it was the the date changed, 
and now it's been uh, turned into a virtual conference and you can access the schedule. You can definitely check out the mentoring sessions which will, which will be really pretty exciting. I know that they would really be, we've been trying to build like a, a good number of people who are going to be there to mentor folks. So if you're listening to this or you're checking out um, TJIK because you're interested in becoming a little a, a part of the project or starting to actually contribute, um, this is an incredible opportunity. Uh, the mentors that we have and the the people involved in this, it's just it's an, intre- an incredible opportunity. Whether they are peers, people who have already been contributing and you want to like catch up and, and chat with some of the other folks who are working perhaps in different areas of the code base, whether it's like the first one, whether, whether it's your first one, uh, like what you want to do, whether you want to become a maintainer of a particular group, there's lots of really great opportunities here. Definitely check it out. Um, that will be happening next week. You can see the schedules and stuff. One of the other big pieces of news that happened this week is Docker has an updated image retention policy. Policy, policy, and I imagine uh, it'll be really interesting to see what happens. Octant is free, and OSS, exactly. Rana saying free is free. We got Pratik saying hello from India, and Jesper saying from the hey from the Medellin. Good to see you. Got Scott Nichols checking in, and Nadim. Do you have a graphical interface instead of a command line interface? I do. I I typically do a lot of stuff in the in the CLI, but yeah, definitely the oct- octant is the bomb. And it's actually really neat seeing it uh, extend over time. I do have a talk this year. Uh, I'll be doing a talk on uh, SecCom profiles and you. It's like a jungle guide on SecCom profiles. And so definitely check out the schedule. Look for yours truly. You, sh- you should be able to see that one. I've already recorded it and I recorded it myself. So it'll probably feel a little bit like, you know, the standard TGIK experience. Um. Let's see. Denny saying hello from Germany. And Tibbin saying hello from UAE. I'm afraid, my friend, that um, I'm in the middle of broadcasting. So I need you to like make that happen on a lunch table, perhaps in the other room. All right. Hanging out with the fam. We got Deem saying hello from Saudi Arabia. Yeah, seccomp operator is the bomb, and it actually does make it, it does make a presence in the um, in my talk for for what's happening there because I think the seccomp operator is like a a very important step that allows us to figure out how to actually get seccomp profiles down to those nodes where we can actually leverage them. And Jenkins X is doing an amazing thing with Octane. Yeah, that's really cool. Yes, you have Brian. Yes, you have. All right. Hey, um, can you close the doors for me also? Thank you. All right. So this one, content I- container image retention policy, make kind of a splash. Um, and what they're doing, I think what they're trying to do, this is per- perhaps not communicated super clear, but what they're trying to do is, uh, you know, reduce the storage cost and reduce the, the retention policy for images that are not in use. How they measure that has always been a bit of a mystery to me because I think that there are times when it's measured re- rationally and times when like the measurement doesn't make a ton of sense to me, right? You're on the wrong side of that door. There you go. Um, in that, like if you look at the pull counts for things, like sometimes it'll be hundreds of pull counts. And I think that partially that's due to the fact that like there are many services like Docker and Kubernetes and tools like that that actually just check to see if the image is is there and that they have a rational manifest for what's on disk before proceeding. And I think that counts sometimes as a pull count, sometimes it doesn't. So depending on where you're, uh, on what you're referencing, like just catching the manifest rather than pulling any layers still counts as a pull. So what they're trying to do is actually remove images that have not increased in pull count over a period of six months. I'm still a little bit at sea about like how this will actually affect folks in real life. Um, I'm curious about it. I'm pretty curious to see like if this will, if this will just happen and not actually damage folks or if it's like, or if it's going to have like fall fall down effects that we don't expect. But um, yeah, it should be pretty interesting how, how it shakes out. So be aware of that. Um, And they, and, and uh, you know, Keep your eye on it. Could be could be some interesting stuff coming up. Helm releases. 
Helm version 3.3.0 focuses on Helm Lint and general stability fixes, which uh, ought to be pretty interesting. And then 2.16.10 is the final bug release. The final bug fix release for Helm V2, which is pretty exciting. Some interesting stuff happening with our friends over at Pulumi. Mike Matral worked with me at CarOS. He's a great guy. And what they're building in is like some discovery stuff around CRDs and, and, uh, and capabilities there. So like the ability to actually reference um, learned uh, static objects from a, your, your given target cluster. Pretty exciting stuff. So really kind of cool. And then this Pulumi Kubernetes operator, I haven't looked at exactly what's happening there, but I'm sure that it's definitely worth some time. Daniel Polenkic goes over graceful shutdown and zero time deployments. Ah, so I do remember looking at this one. This one is about like, how do you know, like what happens when you handle the rollout of a new version of an object, um, like with the traffic that was going to the old one, right? Do we immediately, do we just like, you know, EOF all of the connections that were going to that old one? What happens, right? And they do, and, and Daniel does a great job of like really digging into like what's happening here and how that happens and uh, talking about readiness checks and liveness checks. So if you're curious about that, and specifically, just to be really explicit, what this is digging into is, say you have like two versions of an application. The first version is deployed and you've got stuff and you've got connections going to it. Things are working. And then you start deploying the next one. Well, as part of that process, we're going to be turning off the first version and turning on the second version. And when we turn off the first version, what, what, sort, like, what can we do to ensure that connections that are still in flight against the, that old version don't just get dropped, right? Let them finish their transaction before like actually killing off that process, right? How do we handle that mechanism? And that's actually where a lot of this, uh, where, where a lot of this article goes. I think it's definitely worth understanding that behavior because uh, it will affect how you deploy things for sure. And then I think the last two things, first release of the setcomp operator is out. And then the, my very good friend, <clears throat> Mr. Quentin Machu wrote a really interesting article. He is like the lead uh, platform at BitMEX and does a huge Kubernetes de um, uh, deployment there that actually hand handles a lot of the Bitcoin uh, transactions that happen. And they've been playing with WeaveNet for a very long time. And um, recently, I guess they've just had some more, they've, they've had more challenges with WeaveNet. And so they decided to actually try to make a move from WeaveNet to Calico live in production and this is a fascinating write-up about how that happens. I mean, like swapping a CNI, a low-level component like CNI out in a live cluster, let alone a production cluster, that is a that is an undertaking, right? So definitely worth checking out if that is kind of interesting to you. Um, but yeah, CNI live migration. Fascinating work. Great work from Quentin and the team at BitMEX. And then we get into it. All right, cool. Let's go back to the chat, see how everybody's doing in the chat. Rio saying hello from the Netherlands. And Nadim checking in from Saudi Arabia. Do you have any project in Saudi Arabia? I don't personally have any projects in Saudi Arabia. Jaco, I really think that we should, they should, yeah, I do think that's true. Yeah, I was always kind of surprised that they didn't have, that the retention policy was as wide open as it was. Um, but, you know. These things have to change. Lamati, how much stuff do you think will break when the, when, you know, I, I really do wonder that, right? I wonder that because um, it's it, there, they seem to be targeting inactive instances, right? And like, and, and like I said before, what I've seen from the image pull count is crazy town uh, as far as like, you know, like if you have any reference to an image, it's very it's very easy to see that image count grow, right? So even if like a restarted pod represents a new pull count, right? And so I have a hard time believing that it's going to have like a really big detrimental effect just in my brain right now. But like it doesn't mean that I'm right on that, right? So it'd be it'll be curious to see what happens. Uh, I am curious. I'm curious to see how it happens, and I and I know that we'll be keeping an eye on it. And like I'm sure a lot of people will be. All right, so first thing I want to point out is rback.dev. If you're interested in role-based uh, access control and Kubernetes and that sort of stuff, 
definitely check this out. There's been like, a, this is a great aggregate for um, content related to uh, our back that's being hosted by uh, Michael Hasenblas. So definitely check it out. I'm probably slaughtering his name. Um, but he also has a bunch of recipes, like different recipes for handling things. And I'm actually planning on exploring this a little bit today, the aggregate roles, like how they work. And I, so I wanna play with that a little bit today as we, as we dig into the detail and stuff. Um, but he has uh, links to different applications. Like, I guess there is no link there, but um, good practice to leverage audit to RBAC. We'll talk about audit to RBAC. I didn't put a link into that one. Probably should have though. So I'll link it here. And let's just go ahead and add that. Boop. To our back. This is actually a fascinating tool that Jordan wrote like a million years ago. Um, so let's talk about it real quick and then we'll kind of get into the, the rest of it here. So what Audit, Audit to our back does, and it looks like the last update was about seven months ago, moving Kate's to 117.2 and go 113. What this does is it will give you the ability to uh, um, take in the audit log from Kubernetes and then generate an RBAC role and binding based on what is learned from the audit log. Because if you think about it, each call that we see to the API server it can be caught by the audit log. And this tooling basically tries to like uh, treat it like a learning exercise, right? Where we grant a particular service account admin level access to a given namespace, right? And then we watch that service account go through the life cycle of managing whatever it is. So like, say you have an operator that needs to be able to create things or change things or modify things. As you exercise all of the API calls that that operator might make against the API server, all of those calls will show up in the audit log. And we can take that audit log as input and generate a role and a binding associated with that service account that you had granted like a higher permission to, and then reduce the scope of those permissions to fit exactly what that role, uh, to exactly what was, uh, what fits into that particular capability, right? Which is a really, really, really cool, really cool um, idea because, if, you know, one of the important aspects of RBAC as we explore it is the idea of least privilege, right? The ability to uh, grant permission only to the amount of permission that a particular um, application or user needs. And this is a great way of discovering that whether you associate that with a service account or with a user, you know, leveraging the audit log to parse in, to parse like what uh, what permissions are actually in use is a heck of a thing. Very, very cool. Um, and like I said, it's been around for a while. It's been, I guess, three years ago was the initial. Um, so quite a while, very exciting stuff. I think I blew away my notes. If only I knew where they were. TGIK.io slash notes. All right. And then go back to rback.dev. Yeah. And then they, they, they link to the Kubernetes, official Kubernetes docs. They link into um, some of the different talks and, and pieces that are uh, around RBAC. I highly recommend this effective RBAC talk by Jordan. Uh, it's a really incredible, it's, it's a very good, well put together talk in describing how it works. So um, just, I make the plea to everyone who's like building things with a RBAC, remember least privilege. Remember that like, you know, uh, just granting uh, an operator or an application or something like that, the highest permission to a, the, the admin level to a namespace or something, although it's easy, it doesn't mean it's like secure or rational because if somebody takes over that particular application, they're gonna have quite a bit more control over your um, environment than they should. So keep this in mind, it's, it's an important one. Uh, oh, nice. You know what, the only thing that I was just realizing, that he also, uh, Michael also links a bunch of interactive query tools and I've got a bunch of these in my list, but not all of them. 
find role from finding Kubernetes roles bound to a specified service account group or user. We might look at that one too. That was not on my list. So let's get into what's kind of like built in. Oh, and before I do that, there was actually one more thing I wanted to talk about before we start playing with things, which was this, because it kind of blew my mind. And as a model, I find it fascinating. And I wanted to just talk about it real quick because I think it's kind of a fascinating idea from the RBAC perspective. Let's check in with the chat, see how everybody's doing. We got Scott saying, the main thing that powers our duct type work, aggravated RBAC. That's right. Nadim saying, can you please zoom? Oh, did, is that better? Sorry about that, Nadim. I did zoom it in a little bit. Ah, oh, pa. Oh, pa. Oh, I really like this one, Rory. I forgot about that quote from Ian, good friend, my good friend Ian saying, uh, we are all made of stars, but your R back shouldn't be. And I'll show you what that means here in a second. That's beautiful. All right. Um, before we get into that, let's get into this. So I think this is really, really pretty fascinating. So uh, AWS EKS clusters. So uh, let's back up a little bit. Um, actually, I wonder if this is even related to R back or whether I should mention this at all. But I think it's fascinating. So we're going to mention it anyway. So this is actually about authentication rather than authorization. RBAC is generally about authorization, not authentication. Um, but from an authentication perspective and a little bit of crossover into authorization, I find this idea to be fascinating and I wanted to share it with you. So in AWS, we don't have control over the OID setting, over, over the OIDC uh, flags that the API server is operating under, which means that we can't configure something like DEX or an OIDC uh, middleware in between that AWS EKS cluster and other clusters. And this is probably true of a number of a managed AW, uh, managed Kubernetes offerings. It's not just AWS. And so, some very creative people came up with uh, at, at a Jetstack came up with a way to bolt. OIDC on in such a way that you can actually leverage uh, an, an external OIDC provider, something like Dex or uh, GitHub or whatever you want to use that understands OIDC. And then they effectively map permissions from that, uh, from the authentication call to, um, to the uh, OIDC provider back to a role that has been defined within the cluster natively leveraging Kubernetes RBAC. So this is why it's a little bit related to RBAC, right? Because you're still mapping back down to roles. But what this means is that you have like, this is mind boggling to me. Like for me, I was like reading this going, wait, what just happened? So what they do is they like put an OIDC provider out front, like your kubectl configuration would authenticate to that, right? Your OIDC, it would, it would authenticate to the OIDC piece. And you get your token or what have you. And then your authentication call, um, and then when you actually go to interact with the cluster, you're mapped back down to a token that the API server can understand or forwarded to a forward as an authenticated uh, user to the API server through that, through that OIDC um, proxy, right? So you authenticate to the proxy, inside kubectl is the proxy. When you are authenticated through the proxy, it then maps the call. It basically forward, it like re-encrypts the call back with the uh, service count or token of the cluster back to that API server. So your kubectl configuration doesn't talk to the API server directly. It talks to the reverse proxy. Or sorry, it talks to the proxy. And, and basically there's a mapping between uh, folks that can authenticate and the roles, the built-in roles inside of Kubernetes RBAC, which is super amazing to me like yeah i am roles for service counts kind of similar yep and so i thought this was like super super fascinating and if you're interested in this kind of stuff i think it's great because it actually gives you the ability as they call out in the beginning of the document they give you the ability to actually um provide an authentic provide for authentication when you don't have controls over the api server that would allow for a native integration, which is fascinating to me. Anyway, I just wanted to share that with you because I was like, it kind of blew my mind when I saw it. So 
I thought, like, you know, y'all might like that too. Control W. So let's go ahead and get started on what we're going to do here. Hmm. I thought so. All right, clear. Let's go ahead and create our cluster. I'm leveraging kind, like I always do. But most of the stuff we're going to be playing with today is RBAC. So, great. That's a great tool for that. Ma's saying hi. We got Kohegan checking in, or Kokegan checking in from Argentina. Good to see you. And what else we got? All right. So here we are inside of a inside of our cluster. So let's I, I covered this a little bit in a previous episode when I was doing um, a grokking Kubernetes session about authentication and authorization. But I'm going to recap here a little bit because I think it's important to know like what's built in here. So first, if I do kubectl uh, auth, can I? List, which is a relatively new command, came in like I think it was 116, 115, somewhere in there. So with kubectl auth, can I list? I can actually uh, take a look at the um, authentication or the uh, what I what I as a authenticated user against Kubernetes can do. Um, and this very first line uh, means that I could do uh, anything, right? So this is like. <laughs> Any verb, any resource, any uh, any anything. I can I can I can mo I can modify, get, delete whatever I want to do to any resource within the entire cluster. And this is actually what Ian was referring to so eloquently by "We are all made of stars, but your RBAC should not be." If you see a line like this when you see when you run the output of that, it means you're running as effectively root within the cluster. You can do anything. You could delete stuff. You could be you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Now, um, let's go ahead and create a different role, and we'll show the difference between like the you know phenomenal cosmic power and some more rational set of powers that you might grant to a person in a namespace, right? So let's do kubectl. And for a lot of this initial stuff, I'm just going to use service counts. So create sa ns admin. We're going to create that in the default namespace, and then we're going to do kubectl create role binding ns admin cluster role admin service account default ns admin kubectl. Here comes uh, other really cool tools that we have. Obviously, I think a lot of the, a lot of you may know this, but if you don't, this is other stuff that's just built in the box with kubectl. Uh, auth can I list just like we said, and now we have this idea of impersonation. Uh, impersonization. Impersonization. We're going to impersonate the service account and see what permission they have. So. I could create a cube config based on the token that is generated as part of that service account, and I may do that yet. But for this purpose, for, for right now, what I'm going to do is just take a look at the permissions of that particular. I'm going to impersonate that service account and see what it looks like. So, system service account default ns admin. And it looks very different, right? Um, <clears throat> it looks very different, and we can see that there's a very uh, a very big difference, a very big difference between the previous one, right? The previous one has like I don't know, maybe 10, 12 lines, including this crazy wild card up here at the top. But the admin role is very much more uh, is very much more controlled, right? We have the ability to do things like create, delete, delete collection, get list, patch, watch, for things like roles within the given namespace. But all of these permissions are meant to be admin level permissions 
for a given namespace. And if you look at the built-in roles, and I, I know that I covered this in that previous episode of TGIK when we started getting into authentication and authorization, there are a number of built-in roles, things like admin and cluster admin and view, that give us the ability to like grant a certain set of permissions to users that are just built in. And so I'm using a cluster role, built-in role called admin, and I'm associating it with a service account that we created called NSAdmin. And I can see that the role that has uh, the roles that has been created gives me lots of power within the given namespace that I'm associated with, but not across the entire cluster because this is a role binding. So if I were to do um, can I list dash n uh, cube system. I can see that I have almost no permissions in the cube system namespace, but because I am, uh, because I have created a role binding, granting me all the permissions of that admin role within the default namespace, I can see that I have tons and tons of permissions inside of the, uh, inside of the default namespace, right? And that's mapping this service account, the default, NS admin service account inside of the default namespace gives me tons of permissions. But if I look at some other namespace, I have no permissions. And that's what it means to be an admin within a given namespace. Now I still have these permissions. I can still do things like self subject access reviews and self subject rules reviews, which are tools which I'm actually leveraging right here when I do that get lit, when I do the command um, can I dash dash list. That is effectively an API call to the API self-subject rules reviews that allows me to list all of the permissions that a given user has uh, or that, that, that a given um, entity is authenticated to access or authorized to access. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a big aliaser either. And the big problem for me is that like, uh, I have uh, tab completion, right? And if I alias k equals kubectl, Okay, no tab completion. And I'm like, nah, I'm good. And I could actually do it in such a way, I know that there's a way to either modify the bash completion or register the bash completion in such a way that it actually applies against K as well as kubectl, but I have not dug on, I've not dug into that, so it hasn't really been worth it to me. All right, so our first few examples here are kubectl auth, can I and dash dash as and dash dash list. So these are incredible tools built in the box that you can use to understand what permissions and things are. But remember that, nice. Um, but remember that like when we look at these permissions, right? And we, when we look at the example of the permissions that we have, system service account default and it's admin. When we look at these permissions, what we are looking at is an effective, an aggregate effective permission set for that particular user given that given name in that particular namespace. And while that is like, you know, super valuable to understand if you're like, to, if you're just trying to understand like what type of permissions a given uh, entity might have, it's not going to make it any easier to understand like, uh, some of the other questions that you might ask, like some of the other questions you might ask are like, what can, can I get a list of users or entities that have a particular type of access or a particular role binding or, or, um, or those sorts of things. And that's where we start getting into some of the other, yes, exactly. Where we start getting into some of the other tools that, uh, that do break that down into an easier way. A naive way of handling that might be kubectl get role bindings. Dash O YAML, woohoo, right? And um, there aren't a lot of role bindings within this namespace, but I can, you know, let's see, dash A, right? So I might look at all the role bindings cluster wide and have to parse all of this YAML and figure out like, okay, well, maybe I just want to look for my grep dash A20 NS admin. Okay, so there's my service account NS admin. Right, and they are associated with this. They've got the cluster role admin. You know, like I can, like I can kind of like figure it out. But you can see how this would be a huge pain in the butt, 
right? Trying to figure, trying to parse this YAML output. So let's take a look at some of the other tooling that is available to us. And I think the next thing we're going to do. Do I have Crew installed? I don't. Okay. Well, let's go get Crew, shall we? The next thing we're going to do is we're going to start looking at some of the client side tools that we have. Uh, things like RBAC View, RBAC Lookup, Access Matrix, Who Can, Kubectl Sudo. I really like this one. We're going to talk about this one. And we already talked about our audit to RBAC. So let's go ahead and grab Crew. Oh, that's cool. Install crew and this specific. That's a neat thing. I didn't know anything. I don't know. That, I don't know that it happened yet. version yeah good and then search for the first one on our list is our back view good So this is a UI. Well, it's being somewhat weird about the, oh, there it goes. Because it was taking a second to get its job done. So, ah, this actually kind of reminds me of some of the stuff that we worked on in Tectonic. Wow, that's cool. Okay. This reminds me of like the view that we built in into Tectonic and also I think a view that, expo that is used within um, OpenShift now. And what it does is it breaks down the roles, so different subjects that are associated with it, and it gives you the like, ability to search. And it also gives you the roles that are associated with different admins or different subjects. So these are the subjects that are associated with this role, and it is basically like mapping that back. And then if we look at the, the kind of the larger permission set for the cluster role, admin, let's do a search for admin. Lots of wildcard for admin, maybe it's something's not right here. It's like it doesn't see the other role. So there's the cluster admin role, which is the wildcard one that we looked at before. That was me authenticating without any permission or with the uh, built-in admin role that comes as part of kubeadm. And then what I'm not seeing seems to be kind of a bug here. Like it doesn't actually show me the effective admin role. 
Trippy. Well, so there seems to be like a bug in that there is no admin. I'm looking under cluster role, right? And what I'm trying to see is this one. PG cube kettle get or describe. Let's do describe cluster role. I'm expecting to see an output like this, right? We're in effectively, it's sort of a UI version of mapping this particular permission set in such a way that we can understand it. And I don't see that in the UI. So, or in the, yeah, in the UI, that's trippy. Now, before we go too much farther, I also wanna kick up Octant and take a look at what Octant would show us here. So let's do that. So here is our Octant um, UI. And let me flip to, oh, where is the, is it here? There we go. Flip to light mode so we can actually see it a little bit better. And let's take a look at the view of our back roles. There's a roles and role bindings overview. Ah, it's broken into a different section. Cluster roles. So here's the admin role for cluster roles. And the permit and the and the visualization that we see is basically just a mapping of the verbs and the resources. So for this resource, role bindings, um, we can see create, delete, delete collection, get list, patch, update, and watch. And as we move down the set, we'll be able to see, there's like seven pages of these, right? So we can, we can bump this up to like 100 and we can see like all of the permissions associated with the admin role or with the admin cluster role. Pretty awesome. And we can see that there is a resource called um, uh, the admin resource. And then I'm actually curious if we see the role binding. So overview, it's the cluster role bindings. What happened to the role bindings? I just had them. There are no role bindings in that particular namespace, so I have to be where the role binding is to be able to see it. So there is, okay, cool. So there, here is the uh, service account and the association with the cluster role, the admin cluster role. And we can see the YAML associated with that and all that good stuff. So that's the octant view of the world pretty awesome. Gives us a decent view of how this stuff works. Let's check in with the chat, see how everybody's doing. Hmm. Are you going to cover RBAC groups and how to add users essays? I actually just started that, um, but I'll be doing a bit more of it. Yep. And then Jeremy saying was me, was just me, I guess. No, I don't think it's just you. There's lots of people who alias it. Uh, you just stream an 8k. Am I not, am, is it still not, is it still not large enough? Can you talk about what collections are? What do you mean by collections? Yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about, Kogin. Yeah, like there is a way to do complete where you can actually like map it to a letter, but I hadn't figured that one out. All right. So that was the first one on our list to explore, our back view, which gives us a UI to kind of understand a, a mapping of how things work. Oh, delete collection alongside list. Yeah, so like that's a permission that gives you, so when you're dealing with a group of objects, like say you had, um, 
I'm probably not the best to describe this. Let's just look it up real quick. But I know that it's to do with like, you know, when you do a kubectl get pods dash a, you get back a list object, and that it represents like a collection of things. And you can actually make a request to the API server to delete a list of things. But because at that point it would not be considered a list, it is a collection, right? So deleting a collection means like delete pods dash dash all would be a, would be deleting a collection. As I understand it. All right. So the next plugin I wanted to explore today was our back lookup. Let's take a look at that one. So RBAC lookup provides missing Kubernetes API to view RBAC bindings by user. And I can actually ask it for a particular user. Let's take a look. I think that I wanted to say that this worked, but I don't know for sure if it still work, does or not. It does not. So there is the permission that, here's the cluster role associated with our user. And if we look for, specify the subject, yeah. Do um, kube system default. some groups we have we have system authenticated and what permissions are green granted which is useful information I don't see any references to system service accounts and then user these are all the users we have a, a user system anonymous the controller manager reader manager Cube proxy, cube scheduler, and then what was the other option? We had user, group, and service account. So these are all the service accounts system wide and what permissions they are associated with and what roles they're associated with. So kind of providing a good tool for understanding the association between a particular subject. So there's our NS admin service account scoped to the default namespace and granted cluster role admin. You know what I wonder? I wonder if we add something like if we do kubectl uh, create role binding cluster role. default NS 
admin. You give it a name. Oh, nice. So it doesn't aggregate it on one line, but we do see all the all of the associations. And so if I wanted to see what all of the grants are, what all of the roles associated with a given user are, and it's admin. I can see I created both of these in the same default namespace. If I created one, I had given permission in a different namespace, I would see that differently. But I can see the roles that are associated with it. And then I think they have a dash O wide, which gives like a little bit more information. This is, yeah, nice. So there's a mapping to the source how this permission was granted, right? So in this initial output, it's just saying the subject name is NSAdmin, the namespace is default, and the, cr and the role associated with it is this role. And when in dash O wide, you can actually see the mapping about why, right? That is pretty neat. So that is actually a really helpful one in trying to understand, like, uh, like I was saying before, if I do kubectl auth can I list, I can see all of the permissions, all of the effective permissions, like aggregated down. These are the things that this particular entity is authorized to do. Um, but it doesn't explain this part, right? Which is the real gap in some in some cases when you're trying to understand why, uh, or when you're trying to understand like how permissions are being mapped to a user. Now, what this doesn't do um, is it doesn't necessarily explain. Uh, uh, let me actually show you another tool here. So kubectl, can I actually auth, can I get pods dash in kube system dash dash as equals system service account default NS admin. So this kubectl auth can I command can also be used to ask specific questions like would that user or would the would I be permitted to do get pods in the cube system namespace as the service account in the default named NS admin in the default namespace? And the answer to that is no. Right? But if the answer to that were yes, for example, right? Or if I if I did a challenge like that, and this is actually kind of a, an interesting way of of validating some of the permission sets that you have. Um, this is an incredible tool for, diagno for diagnosing permissions. When you, when I, if this were to say uh, yes, and I was like, okay, but why? Why are they able to do that, right? Then I could use something like RBAC lookup and the NSAdmin uh, subject to understand what permissions were being granted. And that would greatly narrow the field for me in such a way that I could understand, okay, well, here's how we are granting scope uh, we're granting permissions to a particular user for their, or to that particular subject and then from there we can figure out which of those roles has a more uh, has a more permissive permission than we expected right but it's not a one-stop shop for example like there's no way as far as i know there's no way for us to say like for this particular call i want to understand how get pods was granted explicitly i want to understand how get pods was granted to the ns admin subject in a given scope i can't ask that question using these tools but i can get there hmm. good question shall we find out Bum, bum, bum. It's kind of probably not the safest thing to do. But you know what? You only live once. Get cluster roles. Oh. Cluster admin. Oh, that's because I'm authenticating as a... Crap. Cluster admin. It gets deleted. And I think that to get it back, we need to restart the API server. So let's try that out. I 
Actually, yeah. I think that's right. Let's give it a second more before we before we actually try to fix it. Let's just see if it gets recreated, and it doesn't. Okay, so. Move kube API server back. Here I cut all PS. Move. Here I cut all PS. Cut all get cluster roll cluster admin. So on initialization of the API server, all of those default roles are created. So while you can delete it, if the API server gets restarted, it's going to go back through that initialization process and recreate things. Great question. Anybody, anybody else got some like, that was our back lookup, yeah. In a huge organization, thousands of clusters, large number of SA roles and role bindings and multiple tenant becomes very challenging. Yes, it does to be to manage an audit RBAC from a single plane of glass. I completely agree, Sadeep. And that's actually one of the, uh, definitely um, an interesting area to watch. All right, so the question was, if I delete the cluster admin, what happens? And the answer is, it goes away. And if I wanted to like, um, have it recreated, then I have to like re-trigger the code that actually creates it initially, which is the uh, API server startup. So we looked at that one. Let's take a look at access matrix, which is a really neat one also. So this is actually called a request, uh, but I think that in crew, it's actually called a access matrix. So let's take a look at what access matrix looks like in our CLI. Q kettle search access matrix. There it is. Install. Ba -dum -bum. Okay. So this is actually just outputting the same output from my view. So let's do help. Oh, there's a lot of options. Oh, nice. So this one actually does support as, which is really cool. Access matrix for the namespace default as another user for a service account and verbs. Nice. Take a look at this one. So cube kettle access matrix dash dash as system service account default NS admin. No namespace given. This implies cluster scope. And this is really awesome because we can see that we have no cluster scope whatsoever, which is kind of a good thing, in my opinion. Um, except that we have these two things, a cluster scope, which is fine, right? This gives us the ability to actually introspect our permissions. Um, but let's try and kick this against the default namespace. And now we have a really neat visualization for what the NS admin user can do across CRUD, like list, create, update, and delete for each of the objects. Interesting. That's cool. <clears throat> and then I thought there was like one more thing in here that I thought might be interesting, which is an access matrix help
Uh, but this one still doesn't map us, map us back to Y. But it does give us a really nice visualization for how, for what. So this is pretty similar to what we saw in the, in, in some ways, it's probably uh, presented in a kind of easier to understand way. But this permission, but this output gives us the ability to understanding permissions wise, what we can do to what. And um, while it's not, while it's laid out really well, this permission is really like very similar to the permission set that we saw from Octant and from some of the other UIs, right? It's mapping basically yes or no binary. Can you can you do the thing or not do the thing? And then breaking it across the permission set. Let's create, update, and delete. Access matrix does look pretty neat. I like the visualization. Doesn't handle like there's some things that it doesn't quite do. Doesn't seem. Let's see if just intuitively this works. It doesn't do anything. All right. Um, like it doesn't handle like uh, collections and it doesn't handle, it doesn't look like it handles things that may be a, an extension to the APIs. So like um, CRDs and stuff, but what's here already is actually pretty neat. So cool stuff. Next up. As another user, as a service account, then as a different config globally. Let's, let's take a look at that one. That looks pretty cool. What does that do? That command was resource config maps. Oh, that's cool. So for a given resource, that's neat. So this is actually kind of closer. Well, it's kind of closer, but not closer. So this is closer in that it can get us to a place where we can say for a given object globally, what can who can uh, who can do what to it right so it, like you know we can see that like the permissions for system masters or for this particular group they've been granted everything across everything and so they're able to do anything um, for the controller manager group it's able to list any resource uh, any config map but not able to create them not able to update them or delete them we see that the namespace controller can delete them which makes sense we see the generic garbage collector uh, collector can delete them or update them. That's pretty neat. And then within our given namespace, right, the namespace default, we see that NS admin can do what anything it wants within the within the scope of, within that particular scope. But again, the the challenge here is it doesn't map back to permissions. Um, that's I think you know the missing piece of that RBAC uh, lookup was actually providing it was like how do we like when you do the dash O uh, wide, you can actually understand the per how the permission was granted, or you can understand the roles that were used to grant NS admin permission to things, which is actually pretty cool. All right, I think that was all uh, we got. Who can? Let's take a look at that one. I think these are going to be pretty similar. So, I, you know, I'm just going to play this one this way and see what that looks like. Compile who cannot get pods. So this is very similar to the access matrix piece where you can see like who has been granted a permission for a given object, right? So understanding from the resource permission. If you're looking for a way to audit the permissions that have been granted, it's a decent way to do it. Um, and this is actually from Liz was awesome. So definitely solving problems that folks have. That's, that's actually coming from Aqua security. It's another good tool. Uh, this one I wanted to play with 
Cube Kettle Sudo is really, really cool. And I wanted to show this one off a little bit because I think it really highlights kind of, a, 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 I think a better permissions model for managing permissions within a cluster. So here we're gonna kind of pivot away from some of the tools and the models that we de we've described so far and talk about a different pattern. Who am I? Oh yeah, who, who am I is interesting because it's gonna basically put, um, there's no built-in mechanism within Kubernetes to describe who the calling subject is, right? And so the only way you can really understand that is by looking at the credential that you have, uh, that you have access to and understanding from that credential, like what, what uh, if there's some way of understanding who you are, right? So like if you look at the certificates that have been granted, there'll be like a subject alternate name, or if you're using a token, a, Kubeca a service account token, and you decode that token, you can see uh, within that token who's who the user is. But you can't like, but beyond that, like there's no way to actually understand who you are. Um, because Kube, Kubernetes doesn't keep a list of users. And even in our back, we, associ we don't associate, we generally don't associate uh, permissions with a, perhaps with a user, we might grant, we might grant that uh, permission to a group or to a, an identity but there's not like a record of a user. We're not we're not the first we're not the first record, right? We are that for service accounts and things like that, but we're not like the first record the, the first record for users and groups that you might associate with like an OIDC entity or something like that. And so who am I gets interesting because in some cases there's not a way for Kubernetes to answer that question, right? We're farming authentication out to your OIDC provider. We're farming authentication out to uh, whatever you've got wired up in the system. And so we would have to like forward that request to somebody who knew because it isn't going to be Kubernetes. Kubernetes understands whether you're authenticated or not, not necessarily who you were. Kind of interesting stuff. Yeah, I want to talk about RBAC Manager, but let's talk about this first. So, um, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it because it's already 2.12 and we're running a little bit over, but I wanted to kind of talk about this first and then we'll talk about the other two and then that'll be our show for the day. So this is a fascinating pattern and I've spent a lot of time talking to customers about this because I do think it is actually really a great improvement. Um, if we think about Linux as a system, the way that we grant users permissions in Linux is a little different than we grant permissions to things like uh, within a cluster, right? You wouldn't necessarily uh, operate your Linux laptop or whatever as root. You would probably, or even your Mac, right? You wouldn't operate as root all the time, I hope. Instead, you would operate as a regular user and you would grant maybe sudo access to a user so that they could make like big changes, install software, reboot the machine, do kind of do stuff like that. But you wouldn't, um, but, but that gives you like a separation of concerns, right? You're going to allow the regular user to impersonate root or to operate a command as root, which gives, which gives you the ability to elevate their permissions for specific use cases or for specific reasons. Um, and this is a great pattern. Like it really, I think, greatly simplifies the way that we think about RBAC um, within Kubernetes. Right? in that we can provide, for example, a group. We can provide a group and, and then leveraging, Im, uh, Im, leveraging that impersonization piece that we talked about before, we could provide, a, we could create a new group, we could associate with that group some higher permission, and then we could allow impersonization for that particular group from a given uh, user set. And so by default, when a user is added to a Kubernetes cluster, you can grant them like a read-only role. All users in Kubernetes clusters have read-only. This is like a way that you might model this, right? So if you are a part of an LDAP group in the enterprise that gives you access to Kubernetes clusters, you'd be able to grab a credential, you'd be able to authenticate to Kubernetes, and you would only have read-only view of things. But then if you wanted to elevate your permissions, then we would want to be able to like give you the ability to impersonate a different group that has maybe perhaps those other elevated permissions. And that gives us the ability to grant you more permissions based on the access that you have, right? So like a sudo access, a sudo level access. What this does, what, what falls out of this is two really cool things. First, it greatly simplifies 
associating permissions because you're really only creating different roles or different groups uh, that have access to given a given subset of permissions. And then you're mapping those roles down to users that can uh, impersonate them. And second, it greatly reduces the noise that you're watching for in the audit log, right? If you're using the sudo access, if you're using the, um, so the sudo access model here, what this allows us to do is say that, um, is to watch for events that include a key phrase impersonated user, right? And so we still understand who made the, u who made the call, who they impersonated, and what the actual account and what the actual call was, but it greatly gives it gives us the ability to greatly reduce the the um, the noise. Most of your calls are probably view calls. And while it's great to keep an audit record of all of the calls that the API server has for, and it may even be a requirement in some environments, um, the ones that you're probably going to want to really like give a give close close scrutinization to are those things that change resources or modify them or create them. And so I think this is a great, op this, is a great uh, this is a great model for like reducing the uh, number of events that you have to like really um, study. It's actually really, really cool. So I think it's, I think it's an awesome model. And you can see kind of like how this would map down, right? The, the impersonator cluster role and what types of uh, impersonization it can do. And it's really pretty neat. It's already 2.16 though, so I'm not gonna demonstrate that today, but I do think it's worth um, considering if you're thinking about how you grant permissions to clusters uh, or to multiple clusters and those sorts of things. This is a great model for that. We've already talked about audit to RBAC and how it works and what it does. And then the last one that I wanna talk about today is a project from Fairwinds Ops called RBAC Manager. Um, and this is another one that is really cool and I think gives us the ability to understand a little bit more how RBAC can be handled from the perspective of something like a GitOps model. So the Fairwinds Ops folks actually spend a good amount of their time like trying to solve things like uh, GitOps flow where you can declaratively configure in GitOps a configuration and then have that configuration realized against a cluster. And we do something very similar to this sort of a model, leveraging uh, tons of mission control, which is one of the tools that we work on at VMware. Um, but what happens is that you have a way of defining policy in such, uh, and access to given roles. You're able, you have the ability to configure um, RBAC declaratively, and then to have an operator within the cluster uh, implement that inside the cluster, right? And so in this way, you can be very declarative about the permissions that you grant rather than actually having to um, uh, be imperative about the permissions you grant. Now, unfortunately, if I'm using kubectl to configure RBAC, that is very imperative, right? And that uh, unlike a deployment where I might like say, here is the manifest associated with a given deployment, I want Kubernetes to actually take the impetus to go ahead and make that real. Um, and if I wanted to change what the declared state or what the desired state is, I could just modify or create a new deployment and it will move toward that new modified state. With RBAC, that's not the case. With RBAC, there are a lot of sharp edges. We can't like uh, modify some things in place. We can't uh, reapply, we can't re reapply role bindings and uh, role definitions uh, in, in place a lot of times. And that's because we're not sure where to break the line, right? Like we, we um, and so this becomes kind of an imperative thing. And interestingly, this is actually where things like, so I don't know if y'all knew about this one, but there is also this tool called Reconcile. Oh, oh. Cube Kettle Auth Reconcile. And this actually highlights exactly what I'm referring to in, in regard to like imperative and declarative, right? So what we can do with auth reconcile, uh, which is in a way thinking about, so like with a deployment, if I apply a, a deployment manifest and then I modify that manifest and I apply it again, right? I'm changing the desired state and the new, and the new deployment will become the, the, the de facto and we'll see a, 
we'll see Kubernetes like move toward that new deployments configuration. And that happens because everything fits within that desired state. But because auth actually maps permissions from users and roles and service accounts to given, um, uh, to given permissions, we don't know exactly what that desired state is, right? If you were to change, if you were to, you know, define a role binding or define a role and then want to modify that role and, so, and change the, actually in roles it works. If you wanted to modify a role binding and change it and then uh, apply it again, then what you're going to get back from uh, Kubernetes is that we can't apply it because it's already been defined. What Reconcile allows us to do is it allows us to actually be very explicit about what, uh, what, how we want the reconciliation to happen, right? Do we want to remove extra subjects or remove extra permissions based on the change that we saw? Do you want this to be additive, right? And this is basically what, um, kubectl auth reconcile will allow us to do. So it's sort of like apply for things like RBAC, but gives us a little bit more, a little bit more control over what happens, whether it's an additive or whether it's a uh, subtractive, like when we make a change and like what sorts of things can be done. There's great dry run capability here. And this is a, a, a kind of a good way of actually um, framing the subject of how, how, how these permissions and, th and things work. What RBAC Manager does is it takes it a step forward, right? Uh, with RBAC Manager, we're saying, look, we're going to define what the desired state is. And we're going to define that in um, this idea of a CRD. And we're going to derive from that custom resource definition what the actual configuration should look like and apply it over time basically moving the level of control over how these things are defined one level up, right? So you have a place to actually put that source of truth and implement it. And then the RBAC manager operator will enforce it and will handle any uh, conflicts based on the source of truth that it learned from that custom resource definition, which is a killer feature. And again, because now we are in a declarative state, we can actually define those CRDs in Git and apply them to our clusters as we move forward. And it's very, very, a, a very cool thing uh, to think about and how this works. So if you wanted to explore that one, or if you want to see me explore that one, I might do that one in our next session, but I feel like it will take us more time than we have today. It's already almost 2.30. Um, but I do think it would be really fun to kind of model this. And if I were to model this, I think I'd probably want to get somebody from uh, Reactive Wops, perhaps like involved so that they could answer questions. So that might be our next uh, our next co presentation. Anyway, let me flip back to face here. That's our session. I hope that was helpful and fun for y'all. Uh, I hope you like my new background. Let's see. So I would like I would look forward to a single tool, both declarative GitOps and centralized audit tool with intelligence to identify potential. Yeah, that is a neat one. And we're working on some stuff like that, kind of like here at VMware, and I know that we're not the only ones doing it. So um, it's a real problem, and I think people are trying to solve it. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, we've been at this for a little bit, and I, I hope you all have just a kick-in weekend. Um, have the, uh, as, uh, as the Maddie likes to say, and I really appreciate this about him, um, have the best weekend of your life. And so have a great time. Thank you all very, very much, and see you next time.